first of all, thanks a million for doing this. I really appreciate it. You're very um, welcome. It's uh, it's all. I think it's it's always nice to have someone that uh, you know, gives a bit of warning uh, for when the interview is going to happen. You give me a shit ton of warning, so <laughs> <laughs> we we arrange this like nearly a month and a half ago, which I usually have like a day, maybe two days to prepare. Mm-hmm. And usually that's fine. Uh, and then when you said like, oh, the 28th of October, I actually, you said the 28th. And then I realized afterwards it's the 28th of October. And I was like, oh, Jesus, there's a month and a half to overthink every question that I could possibly ask just to go back and forth in my head. Um, but I really appreciate you squeezing us in. Um, welcome. Starting off nice and easy. Are you, would you consider yourself to be a coffee aficionado or a coffee lover? I am definitely a coffee lover. I'll have to say just because of time throughout my day, sometimes I just go with what's most mm-hmm. available, what's quickest uh, as far as coffee choices. So I know there's probably some people that are much more into the coffee world that know the, uh, as far as like craft beers, they're very into the very specific types and blends in, uh, in roasts. Uh, I will say I'm much more than a Folgers coffee lover. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I, I do love coffee. I drink it every day and, uh, I, yeah, I, I won't go a day without it. And uh, something that I love hearing about from guests is like coffee memories. So maybe, you know, I know say my own example is I don't think I'll ever forget having a coffee the morning my daughter was born mm. being in a nice coffee shop down the road, like the coffee. I can't remember what the coffee tastes like. I can't remember yeah. much about it, but I just remember that I had a coffee that day. Is there anything that stands out in your own mind? Um, I'll say there's two things. Uh, the first one that pops into my mind, uh, the last year, uh, two years ago, my wife and I were able to make a trip down to Mexico, uh, Puerto Vallarta. We stayed at this really nice location just right on the water. And they had a little coffee shop within the resort that we were at. And uh, you could just go and get a coffee and sit just right outside your individual uh, room and just right on the water, just watch the waves crash in and you know, just in the morning, it's, it's nice. It's not too hot yet. And just yeah. sipping on some coffee and watching the waves come in. It's just, there's nothing more relaxing than that. Um, and then also uh, for me, I always, especially when I was younger, I would use coffee as a pre-workout all the time. Um, and I would pull two a day workouts a lot when I was a younger therapist, still trying to compete just so I could get my workload in. And what I would do is I would always get some coffee ready around 6 30 o'clock, you know, 6 30, 7 o'clock, because I was starting my workout at 7 30 at night. And sometimes I'd get that pot uh, going and pour it into my shaker cup. And sometimes I just mix it with protein. <laughs> and sometimes if depending on the type of protein that you're mixing it with, if it's hot enough coffee, and then you go to shake it, uh, the, the actual cup will explode. Yeah. Yeah. The top so, like uh, pops open. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So one time I'm in my, I'm in my office with a a bunch of other physical therapists and I'm just like, not even thinking about it, put my protein in with my coffee. I'm shaking it up, not holding the top and just the full thing just exploded. So there's hot coffee mixed with protein powder, just all over the office. And, uh, (laughs) so that that was a messed up memory and a bad memory. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, just incidentally, the same thing happens with baby's bottles. So I learned (laughs) that the hard way in my kitchen, we got a nice new silver fridge and Mm. I was like making a baby's bottle. I was shaking it and wasn't holding the top, top flew off and the pressure of the heat inside just squirted milk. And I didn't, you know, those kind of scenarios where it's like, oh, I really calm and cool under pressure. I know exactly yeah. how it reacted. Something happened. I was basically like a fireman with a hose, just like pointing it around, <laughs> trying to figure out how to stop it instead of just putting the lid back on. So <laughs> That's you know, I think we've all been there in some way, shape or form. Um, yeah. With podcasts then, your own podcast just recently passed 100 episodes. Yes. Um, why did you choose podcasts as a medium? What led you down that path? So the big thing that I try to do is create content that can reach every single person out there. And I know some people learn best through listening. Mm. Uh, There's some people that connect best by reading, which is why I write blogs. There's some people that learn best over visual, which is my, why I make content on Instagram and YouTube. But for those that enjoy listening as a means of learning, I know personally, you know, I would drive 20, 30 minutes to work every single day. And it gets boring after a while, just listening to the same old music. So Mm -hmm. I enjoy personally listening to podcasts as a way of learning and 
also for entertainment as well, depending on the type of podcast you're listening to. So I know, I know that I needed to branch out in that way and start my own podcast. And I mean, at first it was definitely intimidating to sort of figure out, well, what do I need? Do I have to have some fancy equipment? And I just sort of decided on uh, using this platform called Anchor, which is really cheap online. It's, it's, well, it's hundred percent free as far as the setup. And then I just really use the garage band setup I have on, on my Mac. And I just plug in my Apple iPhone uh, headphones and just, go from there and just started to go. And, you know, I know it's been, gosh, two and a half years now. And I try to do a podcast once a week. And uh, yeah, just recently went over a hundred uh, podcasts. Yeah, congrats. That's great. I'm coming to the end of my first year, uh, the beginning of December, and I so badly wanted 100 episodes to line up with the same guys. Uh, I do, I do yeah. one a week as well. And during lockdown here from like March to, I don't know, the like, july i did two a week just to kind of offer an extra distraction i suppose or i suppose to myself as much as anyone else just to give something to do and something to listen to and um i was like shit if i keep doing this it might actually line up and then i worked out that it wouldn't no matter what i did it wasn't going to line up (laughs) so i kind of i gave up the gold on it i think it was just you know gone um when you started your your social media and your podcasts and your blogs did you anticipate the type of success that it's grown to like did you anticipate the 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 amount of people i know you say you wanted to yeah. reach a lot of people but i mean surely you couldn't have anticipated this far reach yeah I'll, I'll say i don't really live that far in the future to really anticipate how things will go um yeah. my biggest thing is i try to live day to day as far as producing content as much as possible and trying to do so in a way that helps other people out, not trying to make selfish content. Mm-hmm. So trying to literally, I mean, the first couple months of me making content, I would literally sit there and I, I, would, I made a post on Instagram, it was just words. And it said, do you need help with your squat? DM me. In the first day I had like seven direct messages, mm-hmm. you know, and I would say, you know, sit there on my couch, Tom, thanks for the message. Uh, how can I help? Uh, you have an issue with your squat. All right, try this test. Let me know what you find. And I'd go back and forth to that person as much as possible. Two weeks later, I made uh, another post, similar thing, 40 messages. Uh, a couple of weeks after that, 80 messages. So now all of a sudden I'm spending like seven hours a day, you know, just messaging people back and then trying to take similar content that may help one person through the direct message and then try to make a post like that. So it would help, you know, 70 people at the time. Yeah. And in doing so, what I noticed was that my content was reaching more and more people and the, the platform was growing and growing. And I mean, I can still remember back to the day where I'm like, you know, showing my coworkers, I'm like, hey, this is pretty crazy. Like I, I have 500 followers. Like this is, this is nuts. And then it became 5,000 and then it became 10,000 and, you know, then slowly just continued to grow. And the way I think about it is not to not to get too concerned with what the number follower count is because it's not, I'm not making the content for me. I'm making it to help other people. And the, I'm more concerned with the quality of the content that I'm creating for the people that do follow rather than to continuously try to get more and more followers because then it becomes a selfish ambition. Hmm. So I would rather have a hundred thousand just diehard people that are that I'm able to help every single one of those hundred thousand people than five million, where there's maybe only a few people here and there, and it doesn't really help that many people because I'm making selfish content that's more about me, me, me. So I think when you approach content creation the right way, things will go where they need to, and the platform will allow you to grow as you uh, are worthy of it, I guess, if that's a way of saying it. Yeah, no, I admire that. I think it's something that I try to do myself as well because like there are there's definitely and i'm sure you had the same there definitely are points in time where you're like shit why did that not do as well as i thought it oh, would yeah. or why did that you know what oh, why have things slowed down or oh, why have things suddenly sped up like you know there, there are moments like that where you do kind of become maybe metrics focused and then i find myself i'll have maybe two days every couple of months where that happens mm-hmm. and then i kind of snap myself out of it and get over it again by usually the way I get over it is I say it out loud. I realize how stupid it sounds. And then I just get on with my day. Um, Here's my way of thinking about that is we're not doing the social media world for one day, right? Mm. 
um, the best, I, I like to use baseball analogies all the time. Um, you know, the best baseball player in the world may have a crappy day one day where they go over four and they hit no home runs. They hit no singles. They, it's just a bad day. They strike out every single time, but they still come back the next day because yeah. they have another game. And, you know, we can't expect every single post to make, to be a home run, to be an amazing post that, you know, goes viral because here's the deal. Too many times in, in today's world specifically, people want to go viral with their content. And it's really not all that it's cracked up to be. I mean, I've had uh, maybe a few pieces of content. Not, I wouldn't even call it go viral. They, they get a good response, hmm. you know? And even then, the next day, that's gone. All right, what are you going to do now? It's hmm. all about that slow and continuous process of building content day after day. And when you do that, it, you know, you learn from the, the posts that don't do well, just like yeah. you would in your own lifting. If you have a day and you go to the gym and you just suck, they're like your hips not feeling well, your squat feels off. You wouldn't just throw and be like, well, you know, I'm going to focus on this day for the rest of the week. No, you're going to go, well, it, tomorrow's a new day. I'm going to come back and I'm going to crush it tomorrow. Hmm. And then if you're doing the way things, I always tell people to, to analyze their lift and understand what they did that maybe had a bad day. Oh, I got five hours of sleep versus my regular eight. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to get eight hours of sleep tomorrow. You know, just the same thing with social media. You know, if, if you have a post and it doesn't do anything like you, you thought it was going to analyze it. Well, why didn't it do good? Well, maybe it's because the, the copy that you had was not very good. People didn't connect with it or the lighting was off or, you know, the way in which you made the post was not uh, as good as you could have done. You know, maybe you need to change things up in the same way as we do in real life. So should our social media, you know, way in which we're interacting with people go. And I think in doing so, it gives you that better frame of mindset to not get too caught up in the metrics from that day to day. Because th there's always going to be days where you strike out and just posts don't do very well. I mean, I have I have 1.4 million followers on on Instagram and there's plenty of posts that I do that just do not do well. And yeah. it's a learning process. Yeah, I think it's funny when you're saying like, you know, you need to analyze things the way you, you would in your normal life. Fuck me, if I analyze my normal life in that way, I'd <laughs> never get anything done. Um, I was going to ask, like, do you feel pressure with, so like, say even from my perspective, every day without fail, I see someone on my timeline share one of your posts as a story. Someone has taken value from it and someone has put something up, whether it's something like, you know, funny pointing a finger at certain type of athletes or you know uh, people who are coaching or people who are training or it's engaging or it's informative like every time you create a post surely then it comes with some element of pressure of like okay you know like there's a finite amount of knowledge you can share so you don't want to be sharing like fluff i guess you need it to be something slightly poignant to somebody so do you yes. ever feel pressure when you're sitting with your phone in your hand thinking like what am i going to do today um, to a point, sometimes I do, but really when it, when it comes down to it is I just go back to, to listening to my followers, hmm. those that ask questions every day. If you go back through any single post that I have on Instagram or regardless of Instagram, every single content platform, you'll just scroll through the comments and you'll see questions. Someone will say, can you make, can you make a post about ankle sprains or, you know, my back's been hurting. Can you make something on SI joint pain? And in reality, it's not as much, you know, create, create, create just off of what I can mm. come up with in my own head, but it's listen first. And then it makes the content creation that much easier mm. because I can create content based on what people are already asking for. Yeah. So in reality, there's an endless amount of ideas. Now, yes, some of them are similar and some of them are replayed. Like the amount of posts I have on how to properly brace before you start your squat or before you start your clean or snatch are endless. There's many of them, but mm. I also realize that there's probably not one person that looks at every single post yeah. every time it comes out. And even then sometimes those people just need that reminder, mm. you know, with the way in which social media algorithms are set up. I understand that if I make a post on Monday, maybe only 2% of all the people that follow my content that day, will even see that post. So it's okay to repeat narratives and to repeat your truths because in reality, that's all you have. Yeah. So 
when it comes down to squat university, it's pretty niche orientated. I mean, there's, I'm talking about lifting. I'm talking about how to get out of injury. I'm talking about technique. I'm talking about how to perform well. I mean, it's sort of all wrapped into one little bubble. Now there's a number of things I can branch out from. I can talk about deadlift, squat, snatch, cleans, you know, I can talk about farmer walks. I can talk about accessory movements. So there's a lot of different things, but it all stems back to these same principles hmm. of moving well, trying to perform at our best in staying injury free. Hmm. Um, your second book, Rebuilding Milo, is due out um, in January. And following on from your first book, Squat Bible, um, how have you found the writing process? So I suppose like writing a blog post or writing you know, a content piece or maybe something for a paper is very different from sitting down to a flashing cursor. That's like for a full book. Like, do you, did you struggle with it? Did you find, is it like, are you naturally creative in that kind of way? Or was it something that you had to work through? So actually you mentioned writing a blog. That's actually how I wrote both books. Okay. Is I actually blog the entire book. Now the finished product is not 100% what only what the blog is yeah I get you. but the way i do it is i sort of have this spreadsheet idea sort of like a table of contents in my head of what i want the book to be about what specific chapters what specific uh parts of each section i want to to talk about and then i from there would break it down and i would blog about that topic and then at the end it comes down to putting everything together and then a lot of different changes. All right, I'm going to put this, I'm going to make this paragraph mm -hmm. go up here. I'm going to add this entire page of content that is brand new. I'm going to add all these different sources that I did not have the first time I wrote this specific section a year and a half ago. Um, so really that's where I try to find my way of, of writing books because I do enjoy the writing process. But like you said, so a lot of people have ideas for books but they don't actually come to fruition because when they just sit down at that blank screen, they're like, wow, this feels like so such a daunting task to write this huge book. Reality, I mean, that's why we have social media. That's why we have blogs. Take it one step at a time, just start. And that's really where it came with, um, with Rebuilding Milo is I had these ideas to write a book about a, a very thick book. I mean, this is 480 pages roughly, all about, how athletes can take the first step to addressing these common aches and pains. I mean, there's not mm -hmm. a single athlete that walks into the weight room that isn't dealing with something throughout their year, knee pain, hip pain, back pain. And what do they do? They either ask their buddy, Hey, I, my back's aching a little bit. What, what have you done? You had back pain last year. What would, would you find was helpful? Or you just don't say anything and just keep on pushing through it because you think it's normal or you go the traditional medical route. And oftentimes, what do we find? We find a doctor who doesn't understand or realize anything about weightlifting. And they say, hey, take this pain medication and just stop lifting so heavy. Give it two weeks off. Still hurting, come on back. Mm. You know, So we're at a loss for ways in which we can optimize the injury and training process. Um, and I know not everyone has a good physiotherapist, physical therapist near them that they can work with. So I wanted this to sort of be the first line of defense to help empower people to take control of their body. And if they do have a good medical advice nearby, they can use that to, you know, have a great conversation with the doctor and be like, well, Dr. Aaron Horshig said this, what do you say to that? You know, have you read this? Have you seen this part? This is what he recommends for this specific type of injury. You know, so you have better conversations and all in at the end of the day, it leads to better outcomes, it leads to us getting out of pain quicker and leads to us getting back to our performance goals faster. Yeah, um, nice. so did, yeah did you, really, did you did you find it hard harder or easier having a publishing company working with you this time because if you self-published the last one i imagine like it's i suppose it's kind of a niche book so yeah your your average publishing company might be like i don't fucking know like yeah do whatever <laughs> you want <laughs> whereas like yeah. you know imagine if it was like a fiction novel there'd be more you know uh might be more creative input from their end but, yeah like did, did you find that they were kind of, they gave you a lot of freedom with it or were they a bit uh, prescriptive maybe? So it's a great question. So the first book that I wrote, the squat Bible, I shopped it around after I had it written and I tried to get a publishing deal just because that's what I was told you have to do. If you want to publish a book, you have to get a publishing deal. 
which is far from the truth. You don't have to. We have this amazing ability nowadays to just self-publish. Amazon has its own like self-publishing author area that will do, you know, you can pay someone to make a cover for you. You can make someone to do a design in design for you. You can do all that without ever seeing someone in person. Um, anyone can publish a book nowadays. So I shopped the squat Bible around a lot and even to the same company that I'm with now. And they were just, everyone was like, you know, it's, it's too niche of a book, just being on one exercise. Um, your audience isn't that big right now. Um, at the time I had, when I was shopping it around, I had maybe like a hundred thousand followers on Instagram, uh, which is a good size, but it, it wasn't amazing as far as like, there's no celebrity to it. I mean, you could have a, a movie star that has a hundred thousand and they have much bigger notoriety. So they may, mm. you know, someone may take their book. Um, so I ended up self-publishing that one. Now this one come along by the time I was ready to shop around, I was perfectly ready to go self-publish again. I will say I am very glad I went with a publisher this time because this book is so dense as far as the amount of work into it. Um, there's over 600 photos in the book. There are probably close to 80 to 100 anatomy graphics. Um, there's just a lot of stuff that would be very difficult for me to have done uh, without the expertise of those who are at the publishing company. So I, I worked with a uh, victory belt publishing and they just have some amazing, uh, people that work for them. So it's, it's been very, very, uh, a very good working relationship together. And I think the book's going to turn out amazing. Um, they are the same company that put out, uh, Kelly Starrett's becoming a supple leopard, which I know is a big mm. book within the uh, CrossFit world specifically, but functional fitness as a whole. Um, they do primarily actually their niche is sort of that sport fitness in health realm. So they put out a lot of cookbooks, uh, like paleo type of things like that. And then also some fitness books before. So that is sort of the niche of this company. And they also specialize in big books. So, um, I know some people know, uh, Brett Contreras, sort of the glute guy. Mm -hmm. Um, he also came out with a book last year. I think it's like 600 pages with them as well. So. Um, they do very beautiful, big books, uh, which is exactly what this is. So very happy with the, the outcome and I'm excited to, for everyone to be able to get it. Yeah, no, it's a, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, weightlifting then, what drew you to that as a sport above other sports? Oh man, I think what drew me to it was it was all on me. It was just me and the barbell. Hmm. In all other sports, you know. That's what put I, most people off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, and, and what I mean by that is your hard work pays off. You mm -hmm. can see the fruition instantly, you know, in, in other sports, it's very either skill orientated or team oriented. And what I mean by that is like, um, you know, football, uh, basketball, things like that. You either are going to be very skilled to succeed. And that's something that ne not necessarily you can improve long-term. It's sort of, there's a lot of God-given genetic gift as far as how far you'll go. Um, and then there's also, um, to a point with weightlifting, that hard work can take you much further than your skill will allot. Yeah. Um, and I just fell in love with it. I, I mean, I remember I got to college the first day I went to Truman state university, which is a small D2 school up in Northeastern Missouri. And, uh, I'd been done. I played football and baseball and basketball my whole life. And I got to um, college and I found that they had the Iron Dogs Olympic weightlifting team. And I had never, I had seen weightlifting here and there, but at the time, this is 2005, Olympic weightlifting in the United States is not a big sport. And it, it's grown immensely since CrossFit has come. But at the time, like you never saw it on TV, you know? So it's a very, very small sport. And I got there and I'm like, wait, you're telling me that you guys come to the gym every day you work out and then you compete in that on the weekend sometime. I was like, sign me up. That sounds amazing. Cause I was already that gym rat. I loved being in the weight room. Mm -hmm. I loved being able to work hard and touch the barbell and, you know, work on my technique and see how by working on my technique and working hard, like I'm going to get that much better. And I can see the changes. Like I loved that ability. So I fell in love with the sport instantly. And I competed for 11 years before I finally decided I needed to take a step back from competing 
so I could devote a little bit more time to uh, Squat University. Like you made it to nationals uh, when yes. you were competing. So yeah. I, you've experienced the competitive stage as an athlete. Um, and I suppose like, like weightlifting is in the news a lot recently. Mm-hmm. Um, what seems like a constant turmoil and controversy, like m- m- every week there seems to be some new kind of rumor or new confirmed rumor coming out. Like, yeah. do you think that the sport has the capability to recover and I suppose like be taken seriously as a clean sport after all the issues that it suffered? I, I hope so. Um, and I know so many athletes who are on that stage of being able to go to the Olympics. And I, I just hope for, for their sake that their hard work is not in vain so that they can see, you know, the fruits of their labor and they can get to that world stage and the sport can remain in the Olympics and uh, not be tarnished by all the different things that are going on. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm an optimistic person overall. So I hope things can, can turn out for the better. Hmm. Um, you've worked with athletes from like pretty much every sport. So like powerlifting, baseball, weightlifting, football, like NFL, Mm -hmm. soccer, like, was there a sport whose participants surprised you with their natural ability or like transferable ability that you maybe didn't see coming? Wow. That's a great question. I will say every sport's a little bit different. Um, I will say like my weightlifters are often, I feel like they get the small changes, the small uh, intricacies of technique that much more than almost any other sport. Um, and this is not a knock on powerlifting because I love mm. my powerlifters out there, but there's a lot of powerlifters who are just big, strong, naturally strong people that sometimes have not had to focus on the intricate details of technique Hmm. and i'm talking like the smallest things i'm not talking like their squat looks bad i'm talking like the specific steps of like making sure they're 100 percent uh breathing and bracing using diaphragmatic breathing and locking everything down and creating that external rotation torque and then going through a perfect squat with maintaining uh without having their foot waver you know some of these guys they're just they've always been strong you know i worked with example for jp price and JP squatted a thousand eight, I think, or a thousand six, uh, a couple of years ago. And, you know, the guy is just insanely strong and he always has been And while going through some back pain rehab, he told me, you know, when we were starting to focus on proper breathing and bracing, he's like, I've never had to, to focus this intently on these specifics. He's like, I just did it, you know, it's like and, that cur- uh, curse of knowledge thing nearly that it was like partially an eight, yeah. never had yeah. to think about it. Yeah. So I feel like the weightlifters have a little bit more uh, attention to detail sometimes because weightlifting is that much more technique oriented. As Mm. far as if you're a fourth of an inch off on a snatch, that's a missed snatch. Mm. You know, like there's the very small finite details in weightlifting that will lead to either a missed or made lift. I'm like, Um, well, you can get it down to within a fourth of an inch. It's like, I'm usually four inches off. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, Exactly. There's a lot of crossover uh, from weightlifting to CrossFit. Um, And as you mentioned, I suppose CrossFit has has helped weightlifting grow, like, you know, get more of an audience, I think. Crazy. Um, As a weightlifter or, or a coach, does it like, does it frustrate you to lose athletes from weightlifting that cross over into CrossFit or, you know, that move into different sports, or are you just happy that those skills are being utilized in some way? I'm just glad that the skills are being utilized in some way, as far as uh, you got to understand that they're very different sports. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people in weightlifting that hate on CrossFit for due reason. When you see someone do 30 snatches in a row with horrible technique sometimes, which is a we, rare we'll, we'll get on to that we'll get on that's, to a, that. that's another that's another topic but for for taking it for what it is you could not walk down the streets of new york city and say hey you know what's how see someone who's fit and say hey do you know how to snatch you know they may say oh yeah i mean i i know what it is i, I don't train it that often but they know what it is you couldn't do that 30 years ago yeah. you know crossfit has taken olympic weightlifting and blown it up so that if people aren't even necessarily uh, competing in Olympic weightlifting, they know what the lifts are. Hmm. You know, it's not as much of a niche sport. USA weightlifting has grown like crazy 
since the boom of CrossFit. So we have to pay homage to that ability to just ha- be a much more uh, visual sport out there, to, to have it in so many uh, other people's houses in doing the movements, doing the clean jerk, doing the snatch. Um, I have not personally had any athletes that I've worked with uh, go from one to the other. Usually it's CrossFitters that start doing some competing in Olympic lifting. And I, I have found it go the other way. People that started off in CrossFit and then they found weightlifting and then they yeah. stick with weightlifting because they enjoy it so much. Um, that, that's usually the route that I have seen. Yeah. Um, you mentioned it there. And I think <laughs> a lot of the time in CrossFit, the, the goal is to finish the lift. So like yeah. regardless of what it looks like, especially in competition, I think either locally or internationally, like just get it up regardless of backs, knees, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, I think like, where do you think the line needs to be drawn on form or are there maybe numerous lines? Um, like for example, say today I did, I'm really shit at, at squatting, ironically mm-hmm. enough talking to you. Um, yeah. and I, I was doing sets of five on the front squat and I'm sure if I did the reps like absolutely perfectly, you know, like entirely upright and, you know, doing everything I was supposed to be doing, I'm sure I wouldn't have been able to do what I did, but then I suppose the focus of front squats, uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm weak at them, is probably to get the volume and the weight into my legs, like and maybe doing it perfectly, and gradually building that over time might be might not be as rewarding for me, given how unimportant they are. I suppose to like the large scale of what I'm doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I suppose like, do you think that, say, if you look at CrossFit, that a a, a line needs to be drawn of okay, you should be really strict on yourself when you're training and when you're, you know, building up to a competition and then at a competition, do your best. But I mean, when you're under fatigue, certain things are going to slip and certain things, like I assume at a competition, even as a weightlifting coach, when you're looking at CrossFit, you're not going to expect someone in the middle of a workout to be like, no, I'm done. I felt my back round there on that last one. So I'm just going to call it there and I'm going to stop. Yeah. I I think you have to look at it as a continuum because the way in which I approach uh, the lifts is twofold. We have injury risk and then we have like performance as well. So we have to understand that it's, it's a continuum. It's not black and white. Yeah. The worse your technique quality over time, over repetition, overweight uh, leads to just an increased risk of injury. It also decreases your performance potential. So if I'm snatching and I let my knees touch on the way in during the pull, that's obviously not a very good pulling technique. I'm not going to be able to lift nearly as much. So the better your lift quality, the better your performance, the less your injury risk. With weightlifting, our goal is to be on the platform and you have three attempts to lift as much weight as possible and you get a good amount of rest break in between, depending on if you're following yourself or, or whatnot. So the idea is, can I put everything into one lift, make it as good as possible, and then rest? So training reflects that. So as a weightlifter, when you get up to train, you are literally trying to maximize your potential, decrease your injury risk. Everything's going to be together. So that's why weightlifters usually on a whole have a immaculate technique because they're able to focus on it. They're not doing sets of 10 snatches. They're maybe doing a triple, but often the volume is low per set so that they can focus on perfected technique, putting all their power into one lift, having it you know, to be as strong as possible. With CrossFit, it's a little bit different. It's a different sport. Yes, the movement's the same, but for the most part, yes. And again, there are some events where it is max effort, but a lot of the events are you know, having a lot of volume with those Olympic lifts, you're doing, you know, a clean ladder where you're doing a clean and then you're running to the next one and you're doing a clean, you're running to the next one. So whenever you invite fatigue into the picture, it is more difficult to maintain technique quality. Now I'm not saying it's unreasonable. You can definitely do it, but your technique uh, has to be that way throughout your training. So Whenever you see someone at the CrossFit Games who has very poor technique, like a squat where their knees almost touch, A, we have to understand they're probably under a lot of fatigue. 
because they didn't just come into that event. They probably have had five other events in there. So A, their body is already probably neurologically very fatigued. But B, they are probably also training like that as well, if it's very poor technique. Because under, under a lot of fatigue, we do expect to see some compensation. And if there's small amounts of, of compensation in just a very competitive event a few times a year, your injury risk is low because there's not a lot of exposure. But when, it's when you see massive breakdowns that you often just got to think that's probably not the first time that's happened. They're probably not under that much fatigue that their knees are touching. So massive breakdown in technique is often due because of the way that they have taught their body to move that way. So the one thing I always like to tell people is that the way in which you train carries over to the way in which you compete. So practice doesn't make perfect practice makes permanent. So if you are practicing and the majority of someone's training is going to be within that 75 to 85% of their one rep max as far as strength work goes, the way in which you move during that teaches your body and ingrains this motor pattern, this way of moving into your brain. So when you get up to squat, your brain's not, all right, glute max fire, quads fire, glute medius fire. No, it just says squat. And just all these things naturally take place together. It's a synchronous movement. So when you see these massive breakdowns in technique, it's often because the body has learned, I'm fatigued, squat, that's how you get the weight up. It has ingrained that pattern that is not optimal into the brain. So what so happens you, so is So do that, you mean, sorry, if you have, yeah. say I'm thinking the CrossFit Games last weekend and they had the, the total was one of the workouts. So back squat, mm -hmm. uh, strict press, deadlift, or well, not in that order, but yeah. so when they were doing their back squats, then say I'm, I can picture one of the athletes and when she was coming up, her knees, you know, did that yeah. just out of the bottom, knees in together. And then gradually, like you can see, you can see the moment that they forced them out. Yes. So if they're forced out, then is that they're, are you saying then that that's the, uh, hours of, uh, mistraining coming into play that they have to force them out? Or are you saying that because they they came in and went out again, that that means that it's no, the brain knows what it's doing and it's just happening because it's a heavy weight. Two things. First, the body always defaults into the path of least resistance. So when you are fatigued, it is easy for the knees to collapse inwards during the squat if you lose proper stability. So if there's a little waver in the knees, sometimes that's just the body naturally losing a little bit of tension. And if you're mm. fatigued, it's normal sometimes to see that happen to a little bit greater degree. If you are doing a squat and your knees almost touch and then come back out, it is because you have taught your body that at the very start of your ascent, that it's okay to let those knees come in. I'll just push them back out once I realize that I, they're that far in kind yeah. of thing. The, the body has been taught that it's okay to, to lose tension in the very bottom of the squat. It should be like, that should not have to be a default pattern. It can be fixed. Yeah. It just has to be learned, relearned basically from the very start. And I'm not talking again about like a tiny little waiver. I'm talking about like a big knee collapse. If someone's like, that's, that's not a very good looking squat it's probably to the point where it's, it's excessive and it needs to be reworked. And, yeah. and the reason for that is, is not because they're at risk for injury right now. They're not going to blow out their ACL. But what they are doing, two things, is they're just setting themselves up for eventual injury. You know, when you see someone pull a deadlift and they're back, they have that cat back sort of round, 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 round deadlift. They're not just going to blow a disc out all of a sudden. But it does increase risk for long-term having an injury. Yeah. And it decreases their performance potential. So injury aside, because we know injuries are slow building. If you have an athlete who has that poor technique default, if they were to fix that, their potential to have greater performance goes through the roof because they're moving on top of more solid uh, technique foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, if I noticed it, it was a bad squat because I don't notice a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. We have some, I got a load. I put up a question box um, mm -hmm. 
yesterday I got a load of questions in so I'll just fire a few of them at you a lot of you know, I I assume this is something that you deal with a lot where like you know you're like <laughs> yes. I answered that yesterday like or I oh like dude I'm know, good yeah um squat mobility so obviously there's a lot of areas to hit mm-hmm. um like there's just no shortcuts I suppose like you you know it's putting in the work yeah. when it comes to squat mobility you can't just think that 10 minutes prior to getting under the barbell a few times a week is enough to make drastic changes. If you're not squatting throughout your day, you're not going to see those long-term changes. I'm talking about like sitting in a squat. Kelly Starr, I talked about this with his very first mobility wad video, like 12 years ago, sit in a deep squat, 10 minutes accumulated throughout the day. Just sit in a deep squat. You're at work, get up, grab the edge of the desk. If you need a little balance, squat down and just sort of hang out there you know the more you time of exposure in a deep squat is the only way to teach yourself how to get there whenever you're under load so it has to be something that you consistently do throughout your day now oftentimes people be like ankles versus hips and stuff like that you know we can get into screening and stuff like that and figuring out what specific joint is your limitation but at the end of the day it comes down to just being in that deep position and accumulating time and that's really where you're going to see massive long-term changes. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's similar with like with weight loss and stuff where it's easy to forget that like, you know, you didn't gain the weight over 10 minutes before you, you know, at your dinner. So you're not going to lose it over 10 minutes of going for a jog or whatever. Like I know exactly. even say myself, like I'm not particularly light now, but I used to be really heavy um, from when I was you know, like 14 until I was like 24. So mm-hmm. I spent 10 years of, you know, you, you, you mentioned compensating earlier on. Like I had this, uh, like in hindsight, literally made no sense and definitely didn't work. But I had this thing of like, oh, if I round my, if I pull my shoulders forward, it will hide 90% of my torso, which mm-hmm. like when you say it out loud is like that literally doesn't make any sense. And I'm sure I looked <laughs> like just ridiculous. And, you know, I was just fat and hunched over instead of just fat. But like now I'm paying the price for that where say I'm finding front squats really hard. I'm finding back squats really hard because I'm constantly fighting, like, especially in front squats, I'm fighting the urge. I'm literally being pulled forward on top mm-hmm. of my body's kind of will to just go back into that default position. So now I'm having to do loads of really boring shit to try and fix <laughs> like you know but even I was talking to my coach today and he was like you know are you doing loads of cat cows and are you doing loads of you know whatever and I, I don't know the name of any of the stuff that I'm doing but I found loads yeah. of stuff on you know through your work and other people's work of like oh you know I was trying to explain I was like oh I'm doing this book thing where I'm facing one way and reaching the other way and you know I was mm-hmm. like I, it's it's hard so I'm obviously doing the right thing yeah. but he was like you know oh, it just it's, it's day by day and, and I found myself typing back like you know when I'm fighting against 10 years of standing and sitting the wrong way so like now I'm having to remind myself even sitting now talking to you every so often I'm like reminding myself to sit back properly instead of hunching and I suppose yeah like you mentioned with that sitting into a squat thing you're fighting against poor behaviors or poor movement patterns that you've built up through either environmental things going on around you or your own maybe lack of movement or mismovement, mm-hmm. I suppose. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've heard a lot of uh, poo-pooing of uh, foam rollers, um, <laughs> especially, I suppose, more so in isolation. Like I think a lot of people hear foam roller and they think, oh, just roll around it for a while and then go train and it'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, is there something that, I suppose, is there one thing that you think beats all and then the converse of that are the things you see as like being gimmicky or being like unnecessary, you know, like I suppose the things that you constantly see are, you know, those complex kind of uh, pulse machine, tens machines or whatever, the uh-huh. vi- vibrating rollers, ice sleeves, all those kind of things. Like, uh, is there, is there maybe too much noise around recovery? And do you think that it needs to be stripped back a bit? Or do you think that those things, if you can afford them are worth it? Definitely. So um, it depends on what device you're talking about, because every single tool is just a tool in your toolbox. and You have to understand what their use is. You don't pull out a hammer when you need a screwdriver, you know? So let's talk about some of the basic ones. Um, A foam roller 
is there for soft tissue mobilization. It decreases a little bit of tone, improves short-term flexibility, not long-term, but short-term flexibility, allows you to move a little bit better if you have some stiffness in certain areas. So if your calves are just super, super sore, you've done a ton of walking one day, you know, you get down on the ground, you mash them out for a little bit, nice and slow, two minutes on each side, you'll probably get up and you'll feel a little bit better. You'll be able to squat down a little bit deeper. So it has its purpose. Uh, a like a massage gun, is technically a foam roller on steroids that you can do to yourself rather than you rolling on the ball <clears throat> or on the foam roller. So it does the exact same thing. So it, it's no different other than the application of soft tissue mobilization. Now, <clears throat> the last one you mentioned was like the complex, which is the neuromuscular stimulation device. Those are a little bit different in that those are great at improving recovery for a different reason. You're not doing mobilizing any tissues. What you're doing is you're bringing good blood flow to the area and you're pumping out debris from the uh, exercise that you just did. So everyone understands the injury process that when you, let's, let's say, strain a muscle, there's technically tissue breakdown, cells died. Well, the same thing to a point happens when you have uh, a hard, intense workout. Let's say you're doing a heavy set of squats. Technically, there are parts of your body that have uh, died off. There is cellular debris that if you just sit the rest of the day, that does not leave the area of that was, that was worked out hard. So there's an inflammatory process in those muscles similar to the way in which an injury occurs. Well, cellular debris does not leave an area uh, through the circulatory system, it moves through what's called a passive lymphatic system, which is like a different network of, of uh, vessels throughout your body. And the only way things move up and down that is through movement. So uh, whenever you put one of those uh, uh, stimulation devices on, it basically simulates movement. It simulates muscle contraction. So you see it's sort of pumping the quads. Well, what it's doing is basically the same thing that would happen if you got on a bike. By pedaling the bike or going for a walk, your muscles contract. Well, you can simulate that movement by just sitting on the couch watching TV and putting on one of those devices. And what that's doing is promoting blood flow to the area and getting away, pulling away the cellular debris. So it's allowing the good stuff in and taking the bad stuff away that promotes improved recovery. So it allows someone to, we would call this passive recovery because you are just relaxing. You're not getting up and doing another workout. It allows you to enhance recovery while technically still resting. So for someone who's very performance driven, they have a goal, they're competing. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Recovery is just as important as training for allowing proper adaptation to training protocols. So if you're just working out really, really hard and then you're going home and you're just completely relaxing and you're not doing anything else, you may not be as optimal as possible in that recovery. Now, I'm not saying you have to go do a whole nother workout, but sometimes doing using those machines, a neuromuscular stimulation device can be very helpful at sort of optimizing that part of the recovery process. Now, they're not cheap. I think that some of the cheaper ones on the market like PowerDot or Compex uh, are within the couple hundred dollar range. There's some uh, like Mark Pro that are a little bit more expensive in that upper hundreds to low thousand dollar range. Uh, but they can be very helpful for a seasoned athlete, someone that wants to optimize their recovery and has some extra cash laying over. It's not a 100% needed tool, but is a helpful tool if used properly. Or if you're sponsored by them. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I like using them. Um, yeah. So for example, uh, if, let's say I have uh, a heavy squat day on Monday and then the next day I'm coming back and I know I'm doing cleans. Uh, I'll sit at night, um, you know, watching TV with my wife. I'll throw on the pads on my quads from my Mark Pro device and I'll, you know, use that for a half an hour to 45 minutes. And I do feel like the next day I have a little bit more bounce in my quads when I'm getting back to doing some lifting. So I think it is a helpful tool. Yeah, I two things there. I think I used a massage gun a good while ago and it was like they weren't really around 
here anyway like you never really seen them and mm-hmm. i remember i had a competition the next day like a, a crossfit competition i was like oh my calves are a bit sore i'll use it on my calves mm-hmm. so i was like beating the shit out of my calves <laughs> with this massage gun for like i don't know 20 minutes uh-huh. and then the next day i could not walk like they were so <laughs> sore and yeah. uh one of my friends is like, oh yeah, apparently like no more than two minutes, like any more than two minutes, you're asking for trouble, especially on like your calves and stuff. So I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> and then another thing I got, I got a TENS machine, like a, a stimulation machine. I just got a cheap one on Amazon. I, I think it's actually for like pregnancy or something. It's just like mm. a same thing, I guess, but mm-hmm. like less, maybe less uh, fancy, but um. I quickly just turned it into a competition of like, right, how, how high, how high can I dial it up and like not turn it off, not pull the plug. Um, so yeah, they, I suppose they have their purpose for you, the seasoned and serious athlete. And then me, the guy sitting on his couch going like, Oh, I wonder will I get to 12. Um, <laughs> another question I was asked a few times is uh, seminars. So I know that I got a good few messages from people here in Ireland wondering, have you any plans to come here? And I got, I mean, I'm not going to list all the countries I got messages from, but are are, are you planning post COVID to get back out on the road? I will definitely do some seminars. Um, I try to do like one to two big ones a year. Um, And just because of COVID, everything has been sort of shut down right now. Um, We'll see what is in store for next year. Uh, I'm going to guess at the earliest it'll be like summertime Mm -hmm. as far as whenever we decide to to finally go. Um, I did come to Ireland though. Uh, Gosh, been a year and a half now i think uh, i did a seminar in waterford okay. um which was really cool uh, but yeah i would love to come back um and i would love to do uh, a number of ones uh over in europe sometime um yeah. i think I, I was trying to do one in chicago um this past summer and then i tried to push it to october and it just you know didn't yeah. work out as far as everything going on right now but yes I, w- I would love to get back on the road next year and uh try to do like one to two like international uh, seminars, uh, every single year. Um, a a lot of people don't realize that, you know, my main job is being a full-time physical therapist. Like I see, I see patients 40 hours a week and then I'm doing content on top of that for squat university. So, um, I don't really travel as much as a lot of other people within sort of the realm of, of what I'm in that, you know, travel and do seminars just because this isn't my full-time job. So, uh, I, I do enjoy uh, getting out there, but it's it's not something that I'm doing as often as some other people. You sh- like you surely are in a position to make it your full time job. So is it just a passion for therapy that keeps you doing it as you know a a, a back burner kind of? Basically, yeah. I, I yeah. just enjoy seeing patients, and that also allows me to continue growing and uh staying fresh with being a practitioner of what yeah. i'm trying to do you know um there's been a number of people that have asked me well don't why don't you take to squat university full time and go travel and do lectures and stuff like that and i also still realize that i'm still young to the game i mean i'm just turned 34 uh i i still know that there's an immense amount of knowledge left out there um for me to acquire so that i can continue helping other people hmm. um so I would be a fool myself to want to stop being that practitioner and just go travel and just, you know, start being in the lecture circuit. So I, I do enjoy being that uh, continued or continual learner, I guess we'll say. And in doing so, it's basically, I'm, you know, seeing patients and learning every single day from my interactions with them and trying to get them better. And then try to, I, I also use it as a means of creating more content for, for Squat University. So I have people every single day that come from all over the world to seek treatment with me, uh, from whatever they're having issues with. And we also, you know, I video a lot of that and turn, turn it into content to help other people that aren't as fortunate to be able to travel to, to the United States. Yeah. Um, there's a meme I see every so often about, uh, squatting like a toddler. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. and someone asked about the, the go to locomotives idea and, I've seen it as well. And I suppose it's essentially based off that idea of like toddler mechanics are king and yeah. comparing them to others. Like it has to be bullshit surely considering how few bones they have. And like, <laughs> you know, I look at my own child yeah. and it's like, you can, she can stand and move. Like I'm watching her move being like, Oh my God, you're going to break your leg. And like, yeah. everything's totally fine. So I assume it's bollocks. Is it? Well, you have to understand context. The first, the, the people that make a meme like that 
uh, there's either two ways. They're the meme where they're like, this is bullshit. Or there's people that are like, oh, this is what you should do. They're sort of both right, but sort of have a little bit of wrong to them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're a child, you have certain proportions in your body where your head's a little bit bigger than your torso and things like that. And bones aren't fully formed yet in certain ways. So yes, you, every single baby squats down, right? And they can have that perfect ass to grass looking squat. And as we grow older, yes, things change. Our bones change and, you know, we have different proportions. So you'll get some people off the bat that'll say, that's ridiculous. Squatting like a baby is, it's not even close to the same thing. Our bodies are completely different. Well, if that's the case, then why can I go to China and see an old lady, 80 years old, sitting in a deep squat waiting for the bus? Because she can squat just like a baby. So why is it okay for her to do? How can she do it? Yet you're saying in that same argument that no one else should be able to do it. So that's the way in which I think that is busted right there. The other thing we have to understand is that, you know, some people's bodies do change as they get older and do not allow for that deep squat anymore. Some people, they grow, their hip sockets change depth wise um, in alignment that don't allow for that perfect looking deep squat. Um, So not everyone can perform that deep squat, no matter how much mobility work they do. However, the idea behind the meme for most people is that you should have the ease at sitting in a deep squat. It may not look 100% the exact same, Hmm. but you should, as a human being, adult, be able to just pop down in a deep squat and sit there comfortably. You should. Now, like you mentioned before, everyone's at a different part in their evolution, I guess we'll say it. You had 10 years of standing with a certain type of posture. It's not going to be undone with one day. You know, and sometimes it may never be a hundred percent like it was 10 years ago because your body adapts and it changes. But when we approach the squat as a movement first, we should be able to work towards a greater ability to sit down into a deep squat as if we are a baby to be able to have that freedom of movement. And that's really where squat university sort of stemmed from at the very beginning was I want you to think of the squat as a movement first before it's an exercise. Yeah. And when you do so and you understand like, oh, this isn't just something I do with a barbell on my back. This is a movement pattern first. And what do I need? I need balance. I need good ankle mobility. I need good hip mobility. I need good pelvic and core control. You know, all those put together, when you focus on all of them and, and regain that pattern, that movement that so many people have lost. I mean, if you line up you know, 130 year olds, and you say squat down as deep as possible and hold it for five minutes. How many of them do you think could do that? Fuck all. <laughs> maybe a few, maybe, yeah. right? Yeah. But we should have that ability. You know, it depends on uh, often how you have used your body throughout your life. I mean, the old homage, you don't use it, you lose it. You know, it, it really holds true yeah. for our physical patterns. You know, too often we, we sit in chairs all day long. When we bend over to pick something up, we just hinge. We don't squat. Uh, we think that we're squatting because we, we do it three times a week in the gym. And even then, we're not really going very, very deep. We're getting below parallel because that's what is deemed a, a proper squat. And even think then, if you were to add up the amount of time you actually physically spent in that bottom of the deep squat throughout your week, throughout your month, would it even add up to a few minutes? Yeah. I mean, think about a regular squat set of 10, you're hitting that bottom and you're bouncing right out. You're only in it for a half a second. Yeah. Whereas it should be movement first. How long are you sitting in a deep squat throughout your day? And I think when you rearrange these priorities and put the movement where it should be, a lot of things get better. Not only do you regain that proper movement pattern that you should have squatting like a baby ease wise, but all of a sudden, like your back starts aching a little bit less. Yeah. And your hip starts aching a little bit less. You know, it's because your body is moving the way it was designed. Yeah, I like that. Um, something struck me there when you were talking about lining up 30-year-olds and asking them to squat. Something that you see commonly, so obviously there's issues like you mentioned, you know, like backs and knees and hips and everything might be changing m- movement patterns or like stopping people from moving into a certain position without like you know rectifying some issues first maybe 
Mm-hmm. Something that you commonly see, I think, is when you tell people to squat, they kind of half squat, half hinge, and like the like the head moves down, we'll say, but it's largely because they're, you know, kind of, I don't know how to describe it, like collapsing themselves forward as they move down a little bit. Why yeah. is that a go-to for so many people? What is it that's causing, is that just a, like a, a basic breakdown in understanding of what their body is doing or is it like a compensation thing? It could be both. Um, whenever you have limited mobility and I'll say like limited ankle mobility is one of the most common problems. I harp on it constantly on Instagram to some people. They're probably like, gosh, this guy's posting about ankle mobility again. <laughs> but literally it's because that's, it's such a common problem. Yeah. When, when the ankles are limited, as you go into a squat, your knees won't be allowed to translate further forward anymore. So something has to compensate in order to allow you to continue your depth, which often means that your trunk is going to start falling forward. So you have more trunk inclination, basically fall forward like an accordion. So that could be one thing. The second thing could just be balance. You've maybe just not been told how to properly yeah. coordinate and balance your body. So we can't assume anything. That's where the screening process comes in because you could have five people that all show that same squat fault, but it could be for very different reasons. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last listener question then was uh, gear, like not steroids, like apparel. <laughs> so <laughs> when, yeah. uh, when does one incorporate lifters or a belt and when is it an unnecessary crutch that, you know, could be pushed further ahead? I would highly recommend young lifters not wearing a belt for at least a couple years into their training. And for the reason is I want them to learn how to create <clears throat> proper stability in their natural weightlifting belt from proper breathing and bracing. And I think too often we go to the belt too soon. Um, I, as far as weightlifting shoes, um, ideally saying someone has proper movement patterns first allows them to squat barefoot easily. What happens is that weightlifting shoes can be a dramatic help to a lot of people. Um, and for the sport of weightlifting are a necessity. So if you're performing cleans and snatches, you need weightlifting shoes because it allows you to get into the most technical positions. Plus it's also a safety requirement per the IWF's, uh, you know, rules and everything like that. So, um, you have that to, to think about when it comes to your standard, uh, CrossFit athlete, I think it comes down to sort of train what you can train while you fix what you can fix. I don't have a problem with athletes wearing weightlifting shoes when it comes down to performing certain lifts, because let's say you have, you know, Jimmy, the 30 year old that's coming into CrossFit for the first time, or he's in there for his first year, he's still a newbie, but he has some movement issues. He's got some really bad stiff ankles. Well, putting him into a weightlifting shoe may allow him to assume a more technically proficient lift. And it looks better. He's moving better. He has less aches and pains. That doesn't mean he doesn't still work on his squat Mm -hmm. form outside of his shoes. It shouldn't be. The problem arises is that whenever he puts a barbell on his back or whenever he does a squat, he's only ever in his weightlifting shoes. Then we're using it as a crutch. The way I like to use it for weightlifters specifically is I want you to warm up barefoot. I want you to do barefoot bodyweight squats and I want you to do maybe your first two sets with the barbell and maybe a light load, a hundred percent barefoot because it's so important to understand the foot ground connection and whether or not you're balanced and creating that sufficient foot stability, your body weight spread evenly across the three points of the tripod, the, the heel, the first toe, the base of the fifth toe. And too often shoes hide that balance and they hide that position of the foot to where you're not even aware that you have a bad foot position. And what that leads to is just a problematic squat, even though it may look good on the outside, there are small issues on the inside that are taking place that are decreasing your uh, final potential and maybe potentially setting, setting you up for an injury. So getting barefoot and, and optimizing that ground interface is huge. And then if you need to throw your weightlifting shoes on, that's okay. I'm okay with it. I'm not hating on that at all. I was a weightlifter for 11 years. I, every time I do cleans or snatches, I'm putting on my weightlifting shoes, but I also do a lot of squatting barefoot right now. Hmm. Um, we'll finish with a quick fire. Hmm? Let's do it. Um, so snatch or clean? Uh, clean. Uh, coach or compete? Compete. 
Uh, squat or deadlift? Squat. Flat white or an Americano? Mm, Americano. Uh, favorite stretch? The world's greatest stretch. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's good. The name says it all. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. <laughs> um, writing or recording? Uh, writing. Nice, okay. Um, well, listen, thanks a million. Uh, best look yeah. at the book. And Thank you so much. He get doing some seminars soon. Um, if everything evens itself out, um, I, I think it. I could sit and ask you ten thousand questions just about my own <laughs> squat. So yeah. um, I appreciate you coming on, and hopefully people took some stuff from it. I know I did. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on. Cool. Thanks, Mel. <laughs>